What is happening? It is time, guys, for another MLB Live Before Lock. We're going to try to dodge raindrops and find the best ways to give you guys some advice for today's slate. And at least the night slate, we've already had some games canceled in advance. So hopefully not like the uh, early slate, which was uh, super, super tricky to navigate with the weather. There's still two games in rain to like. Who knows if they're going to play? They might end up playing uh, after the night slate game. So uh, weather concerns definitely were a plenty today. And uh, yeah, weather pretty shitty by me as well. All I'm going to ask for you guys as you watch is to like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you have any questions for us, you guys can leave super chats. And don't forget that if you are watching in our Discord channel, one of the perks of being a stochastic sub is that you do get access to our Discord channel. You could ask me questions whenever you want. We'll be answering some of those over the course of the show. Uh, to start, Matt, uh, what did you end up doing with the uh, early slate and the rain and all the nonsense? I ended up avoiding all the rain spots. Okay. And Still not doing, I'm still not going to make money uh, just because I stacked Miami. My pitchers were good. I used Eovaldi, Savali, and AJ Pook, who was okay. But the bats just didn't do anything for me. Considered stacking the Angels, didn't do it. Not like they were amazing, but they were certainly better than the Marlins. So at least I don't have to sweat out these last two rain games. How about you? I, I don't know. So because there was... I was actually really excited for the afternoon slate at first. I went and looked because some of these Wednesday, Thursday days are actually some of my favorite MLB slates. The ones where it's like you get a substantial afternoon slate, a substantial night slate. But I was looking at the weather this morning and I was like, you know, I've got a bunch of meetings that I had a lot of stuff to do in the afternoon. I was looking at the weather. I'm not going to be around to be able to update all my lineups if games get canceled. So I, I just played one lineup. It is a Philly stack. So to be determined for a couple of reasons. Number one, the game hasn't started yet. Number two, we don't even know if the game is going to play. I assume they've been waiting for these games at this point. They're going to play them at some point. Like imagine if you're an Orioles fan, you've been sitting there for four hours and they cancel the game afterwards. Cause it, like, why, why would you have the game in a four hour rain delay if you're not going to end up playing it? Yeah. I mean, I, who the hell knows these teams decide crazy stuff all the time. I'm with you. I read that the Philly game is they're trying like they're going to start at whatever time to get it in today because the players want their off day tomorrow. So we shall see. But we have a, lot, a couple of tricky spots on this night slate also. Yeah, and we are going to uh, walk through that. But I'll say if I if I was somebody who had tickets to the Orioles game today and they don't end up playing, I would be furious. The game was supposed to start at one o'clock. It has been in a four hour rain delay. Fans have been sitting there in the stands. It was a total dickhead move if they end up just uh, canceling the game after this point. And I mean, they, who knows how much concession money they've raked in at this point. But yeah, let's start by talking about the weather for tonight. We do have games that have already been canceled. So as a result, here's what we're looking at for the night slate. We have the Pirates and Nationals playing at 645 Eastern time. Rockies and Cubs at 740. Blue Jays Astros at 810. Giants Dodgers at 1010. We're down to just four games for tonight. But uh, anything else you want to comment as far as the weather is concerned for tonight, Matt? It's probably more like a three game slate. Um, just because, you know, after the rain out in Chicago earlier, I have to think that the other Chicago game also might not play. Might play, but it might not play. So. Could be really slim pickings, but it is a fun slate with good options all around. Are you going to avoid the Cubs-Rockies game? Yes, I am. Um, because if enough, even if it plays, it's really, really good pitching weather. But the pitchers are awful. So I don't think you're crazy to consider pitching in that game. I don't really like the offense at all. I mean... Any time, any offense against Cal Quantrill, I guess, is always in play, but really tough hitting conditions here. So it's not a game I love, anyways. I won't like remove it though, just because there's only four games. I'm leaving it in for now, right? I've built out my lineups, and it's hard to just default to saying this is going to be a three game slate. Now, it, it's very possible an hour from now the weather looks even shittier, and then they just, and then we just kind of are going to have to make a decision at some point. I do wonder as well, and by the way, right now, if you're asking me about my best guess, does the game play or not, I'm going to say it doesn't play. I, that, I think that's the most likely scenario that ends up uh, happening here. But something else we should consider as well here, thinking about how the early slate played out, the just total headaches with games being delayed, games being postponed. If this game 
is going to be 50-50. Like maybe it looks a little bit more promising in an hour than it does now. This game could be way underrepresented by the field on a four-game slate because I think there's a lot of people who are going to be like, I got fucked on the early slate. I am not going to go down that road again and play a questionable weather spot for tonight. So I'm hoping the weather improves so that I could play it. Uh, the Cubs were a team that treated me pretty nicely as a stack yesterday, and it is a stack I would like getting to today. Uh, if I was setting my lineups and had to enter them right now, I'll tell you guys I wouldn't play this game, but I'm holding out hopes that the weather looks better in a little bit. That's fair. I'll I'll say this, though. like The games that people got, quote-unquote, screwed on might play. So like it's not like those games have been rained out. And everyone who played those games in the afternoon slate knew the weather going in at least you know most people that are playing mlb dfs so like i do think that the cubs game will be underrepresented more so just because of the risk itself not necessarily because of today's games though you make a valid point no doubt yeah and uh i'm, I'm sure we're going to see people who are like i said before just like yeah not not dealing with more weather because i mean almost everybody if you played at any uh decent amount of lineups and if, you, if it wasn't like if you're in math situation you were just playing you know one two three lineups and you're hand building and you're just avoiding the weather scenarios it's probably a little bit easier to avoid it this morning but if you were playing anything like 20 plus lineups you you ran into weather True. in some sort of even way. in my situation i like had to go out of my way to do it i was like hoping that the so you're you're right on that that's a good call we got a uh, ryan morowski in chat saying it's 35 and snowing in chicago the game's not being played uh, so the other whites, the White Sox game got canceled. The Cubs game, I, I, it's not officially canceled. I think the most likely scenario is that it doesn't play, but we only have a four game slate. There's only so many things to talk about. And I think we should at least explore the possibility of that game playing and how it could impact our, our lineups here. By the way, is anybody else having issues hearing me? Rob H in chat just said that he uh, can't hear me at all. So I'm going to say, Rob, if you can't hear me and other people can't, maybe it is an audio issue on my end, but maybe turn up your volume a little bit. Maybe that's a, maybe that's an issue as well. But uh, as far as other questions in here, I, I always like at the start of the year when we get just general MLB DFS strategy questions where we got one here from Dwayne Crawford who said, what, what is considered a stack? He wants to know what is a stack? And generally I consider a stack to be any lineup with four or more players from the same team as a primary stack, but you could also have three two-man stacks as a secondary stack. Uh, but I'm usually looking at a primary stack, anything four or more players from the same team. What do you consider a stack though, Matt? That's a good question. Like in, so a stack in its simplest form is just any amount of players from the same team. Ideally, the closer they are in the lineup together, the more correlated they are. So when you talk about a five-man stack, you're talking about five hitters from the same team. Four-man, same thing. Three-man, two-man, et cetera. Well, no, there's no one-man, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I consider a stack. Um, I don't know. And obviously, you can get more nuanced and detailed into it, but that's the general definition in my eyes. Yeah, and also very pertinent point here by Pi Daniels. He said, uh, fat ass, that could also be considered a stack. That's true. It's a good point there, Pi Daniels. You don't know what kind of stack that he was talking about in there. I assumed MLB DFS, but maybe I made a, a wrong assumption. Maybe I don't know why I, I assumed he was talking about MLB DFS, but good point. He absolutely could have been talking about booty there. Uh, let's get into talking about some of the pitchers for tonight, Matt. And yeah, not very many options to choose from. We've got Glass now on the high end, and I, I guess we should probably just talk about Glass now on his own because he is ninety eight hundred dollars on DraftKings on FanDuel. He is ten k DraftKings. He's projected for fifty six point four percent ownership. FanDuel forty six point five. So this is a guy in Tyler Glass who's going to be somewhere around half of the field's lineups in large field tournaments. How are you going to approach him today? This is not a guy who's dealing with one of the weather scenarios. He is one of the most talented pitchers on baseball, and we've only got a four-game slate. So relative to ownership, what do you make of Tyler Glass now? And uh, sorry, one other thing I'm going to add before you answer this, Matt. If you guys are playing cash games today, play Tyler Glass now. It's the biggest no-brainer that you're going to have on the entire slate. But tournaments relative to the ownership, how are you going to handle Glass now, Matt? I think there's certainly like merit to getting away from him. Because of the ownership, he is quote unquote overowned. But 
got to roster two guys on DraftKings. Like he's far and away the best pitcher on the slate. It's not even a normal slate. Like there's weak options throughout. The other decent options are in tough matchups. I think there's like merit in, especially if you're multi entering to like fade glass now a little bit and play some of the giants because that's where the big leverage comes in. But for someone like me, I'm going to play glass now. Even if he's not amazing, he'll still probably be the best pitcher on the slate and get different elsewhere. Again, I see the merit in getting away from him just because of the ownership and it's baseball, but he's also like, he's not Spencer Strider good, but he's a legit number one starter. You know, he's not like some middling guy that's just getting ownership because of the matchup or whatever. Like he's really good. So I feel pretty comfortable with it. Don't love the ownership, but it is what it is. How about you? I find it very difficult to get away from Tyler Glass now today, especially because if you start building lineups that don't have Tyler Glass now, the end result is going to be a bunch of lineups like $1,500 in salary left on the table. And at that point, like I'd rather just upgrade from Chris Bassett to Tyler Glass now. I'd rather just upgrade from Christian Javier to Tyler Glass now. So I know he's going to be really popular, but this is a spot where I find it hard to get away from. Something else as well about Glass now, this is already his third start of the season. So we don't have to worry about pitch counts in the same way with him that we do with some other pitchers. I mean, th- this guy has gotten to be stretched out just by the nature of started on opening day back in the uh, Korea game that MLB weirdly decided to do. Then he comes back. He pitches for the Dodgers again for regular opening day. And now we've got a situation where it's going to be his third start of the season. So we should see a full pitch count for glass now. His numbers for the start of the year, his strikeouts are oddly down, but considering his acumen as a strikeout pitcher, I'm not all that concerned about it. It should bounce back. And if you look at his average fastball velocity this year, it's sitting at 96.8 miles per hour. That's really strong. So I'm expecting Tyler Glass now to have the strikeouts going sooner rather than later. And uh, one other thing I'm going to tell you about Tyler Glass now, Matt, that still tilts me all the time about Glass now. And since we've got a a little bit more freedom with our time here, considering it's only a four-game slate, When Tyler Glass now first got called up to the big leagues, I was rostering him all the time in DFS. He was min price on DraftKings and FanDuel. He had no ownership, and everybody always thought he was terrible because he was getting his ass kicked. And I lost money on this guy for a year and a half playing him in DFS. So the fact that he finally panned out, I think I could go back and be like, boy, I feel good that I played Tyler Glass now like 2% ownership at min price. But it, it really does suck in hindsight that he screwed me over on so many slates at this point. But yeah, I think Tyler Glass now, this is a piece of chalk to be eating today. And I'm going to go into Discord to see if we have any questions here. And oh boy, we do. BBCGC in mouth eight, our friend. <laughs> and it looks like we do we have a, a potential a potential uh, bit uh, stewing here because he did want to know who is the uh, BBC play of the night. So I think that is something we could add to baseball. So who's going to be the uh, BBC play of the night? And then he also wants to know who our least favorite stacks and pitchers are. So uh, talking first on my least favorite pitchers on the slate, uh, Cal Quantrill and Ben Brown. <laughs> so yeah, the, the for thing sure. Is, th- they would be my least favorite pitchers if there were no weather concerns. And now we're adding the weather concerns on top of it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Although in a weird roundabout way, the weather concerns kind of make them look better just because if the game plays, it's such bad hitting weather. Like, I don't expect the game to play. So ultimately, I think the answer is, I would say Trevor Williams, but for me, I think it's Kyle Harrison, like, priced up against the Dodgers. Um, Yeah, I struggle to get to Harrison. Um, That's just me. And uh, by the way, Malukar said the link below wasn't working to sign up. I'll uh, I'll go check that right now. But yeah, today is the final day of the Dinger promo. So if you guys are looking to take advantage of that 30% off, sign up with the promo code Dinger. You get access to any package at the site you want for 30% off, whether that's the lineup generator, Sims package, data package, sign up for any of those using the promo code Dinger, and you're going to get yourself 30% off. Malachar, I'm going to test that right now to see if I can figure out what's, uh, what's going on here. Let's see. I'll do this while we're uh, talking. It should be working, though. Oh, okay. Never mind. Never mind. Crisis avoided. Malakar wasn't logged in. So, all right, we, we figured it out. It's all, uh, all well and good. Thank you, Malakar. Appreciated the, uh, the quick follow up there, but yeah, same thing applies. If you guys want to get access to that dinger promo, like Malakar was trying to, this is the uh, last call to go and sign up for that. 
Uh, but talking about BBC's question here, Matt, and you can answer this however you want. Who's the BBC play of the night? So his handle is BBC and he's asking about the BBC play of the night. Yeah, he's a little self-absorbed, but it's okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Who, who is it going to take? Here's, here's how I think we should answer it. Which play on the slate is a reasonable tournament option that you like, but is going to take some massive cojones? Oh, I like that. Um, Chris Bassett. Uh, I mean, I think that answer is actually pretty easy for me. Again, pitching options are really weak. FanDuel, I wouldn't even consider him because I just play glass now. But on DK, you can't do that. You know, we stacked against Javier in his first start with the Yankees. I'm going right back to Toronto here. I like the Bassett side more, knowing that it's Houston. Like, they're really good. For what it's worth, they've only been really good for one game this year. Again, it's not worth much because we know what this lineup is. But Bassett is a workhorse. He threw a ton of pitches, like 90-some in his, in his season debut. He wasn't even that great. So Bassett's my uh, BBC play of the day. Uh, let me see for uh, for myself here. Bassett's a potential one for sure. But it's kind of now I feel like this is a, this is a hard one to find the, the real ballsy play to get to. I would say stacking the Chicago Cubs if the weather gets a little bit better. A little bit better. Like I said, not going to play it if it stands now. But if you guys want to roll the dice on some weather, if it starts to look a little better in an hour, I think that's probably the more the most the most sensible while also having the most upside way to differentiate yourself in GPPs. We just have to make sure the game ends up playing. And then he wanted to know who are least, oh, we already answered least two favorite pitchers. Stacks, we'll talk about those in a second here as well. I want to shout out Andy uh, Millman in chat, who says, just want to say thank you, Greg and Matt, for all your insight. I hit the WFBC on FanDuel last night. The Sims is fire. So Andy, good to see that you had some success. And yeah, last night uh, I had, I've been on a good run with some of my uh, home run picks. I had another one last night with Seiya Suzuki. Cubs were my favorite stack. And yeah, they ended up coming through for me. I was in first in some of the single entry stuff for a good amount of time last night. Unfortunately, got screwed by the blow up by uh, Luis Castillo. So yeah. still did pretty well and finished like top five in a lot of the single entry stuff. But uh, I was feeling really good, especially about the ownership difference because Bieber ended up being over 50% on single entry. Castillo was around 10%. Who is your other pitcher? Uh, Assad. Oh, okay. Because I feel like at by the end of the night, you needed Bieber over over Castillo. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, so that was like, and I was at anywhere from like five to ten points out of first in a lot of those Damn. lines. Or because I had Pablo Reyes as a, as a one off. If he didn't get pinch hit for, that also would have been uh something. So but, yeah, it was a good night. I ended up like. 20 xing my money but it could have been way better if it was uh not for uh, luis castillo there jason swing in chat says this bbc stuff is ridiculous he's a paying customer that's what his name is in discord what am i gonna do about it i can't force him to change his name it is what it is there uh, i also like this question that we got in youtube from who was it it was somebody asked us if it was okay to take a zero at pitcher today or to try rostering a reliever. I'm trying to figure out who it was that I can't find who asked the question. So the answer for me is uh, no. I understand where you're getting at here because it's a four, potentially three game slate. Some of the pitching options, not necessarily the uh, greatest. There are individual slates where you could play a reliever. This is not one of them though. The ones where I'm okay with playing a reliever, it's like those two game afternoon slates where there are pitchers who are really, really blow up prone that could go out and score negative fantasy points. There's nobody I'm looking to roster out of the bullpen for tonight, though. Is is that where you're at as well, Matt? Yeah, that's only even a consideration for me on a two-game slate. Like, definitely not on a slate like tonight where you have, like, decent pitching options, even if they're not in good spots. You've got actual starters here, like a few of them. Yeah, and we should uh, talk about some of those other actionable starters and uh, by the way, we did just get word here that the Royals Orioles game is expected to start at 6.05. So after a five hour rain delay, it looks like they are going to have a first pitch there. And if we go ahead and look at the other decent pitching options, 
We'll group these guys together. Mitch Keller, Chris Bassett, Christian Javier. They're 82, 86, and $8,800 on DraftKings as far as the ownership is concerned. Javier, 28% owned. Keller, 26% owned. And then Bassett's at 13% owned. So you've got really low ownership coming into Bassett. The other guy's ownership in the mid-20s. Given that information, Matt, which of the mid-range pitchers are you liking the most overall? Oh, it's easily Bassett. He's my BBC play of the day, and he's one of my favorite plays on the slate. I get it. You know what you're getting into bed with when you go up against Houston. They're upside. They don't strike out a lot. In my mind, I think Bassett's the second best pitcher on the slate behind Glass now. He threw 90-some pitches in a season debut. Wasn't great against Tampa, but still got a ton of swinging strikes. I'm a Bassett, I'm a Bassett guy. He's a workhorse, even if he's not like in a, a number one pitcher or anything like that. He's might be my favorite overall play stack pitcher on the entire slate, given the ownership. Yeah, and it's it's not a spot you're going to feel good about with Chris Bassett. And I understand what you're saying. So like for me, if I'm just playing one lineup, I would not have Bassett in that lineup for myself, but large field tournaments, when I'm looking at my lineups all being built out through the Sims, I do come in overweight to the field on Bassett because if you look at the other options at pitcher, Glass now, super popular. Javier, popular. Mitch Keller, popular. There's only so many low-owned pitchers to like on the slate. And we've got Chris Bassett going up against Houston. We've got Kyle Harrison going up against the Dodgers. Then you got Trevor Williams going up against his former team, the Pittsburgh Pirates. So if you're just looking at those names and their salaries, the matchups, you can't feel great about any of them. But we could at least say that we could confidently say Bassett's the best pitcher in terms of those shitty options, right? I think so. And, like, the ownership is crazy. I get it. Like, on a lot of slates, Bassett would be an afterthought at 8,900 or 8,600 against Houston. But this isn't a lot of slates. Like, after Glass now, every option either sucks or is in a bad spot. So, like, Harrison getting more love than Bassett, I get it. He's cheaper, but I mean, come on, like the spot's even worse for Harrison. I'd much rather go up against Houston right now than the Dodgers. Astros might make me eat my words there tonight, but that's how I see it. Yeah. So uh, Chris Bassett, it's, if this was a slate with even six games, he probably wouldn't be a consideration for him, but large field right. terms as a contrarian play. Yeah. I, I think that he is worth getting to in a, in a large set of lineups. And then as far as Christian Javier and Mitch Keller goes, let's uh, let's rank out the, well, it's only a ranking of two, but let's rank out the two chalky pitchers in this eight K range. For me, it's going to be Mitch Keller, one Christian Javier two. How about for yourself? And then we'll talk a little bit more as to uh, why we're putting them in this order. So this is after Bassett or? Yeah, so after Bassett, between the, the chalky guys, if you had to choose between Mitch Keller and Christian Javier, which direction do you go in? I'm going to go option C and neither. Um, I like both offenses they're facing. If I had to choose one, it would be Keller because the matchup is just much better. Um, but I don't really like either of these guys, so neither for me. Yeah, so... For me, between the two of them, it's going to be Mitch Keller over Christian Javier. Here's the main reason, though. I like the Blue Jays as a stack because of the home run upside that they have going up against Christian Javier. And same reason that I stacked against Christian Javier's first start, which ironically went well and poorly at the same time because Christian Javier pitched really well with the Yankees put up runs. I think they scored seven runs that game. It had nothing to do with my analysis, though. I just kind of got lucky that the Yankees scored against the bullpen. But Christian Javier is still an extreme fly ball pitcher with a really high home run to fly ball rate. He is somebody who, when he gets hit, it's going to be him giving up home runs. And that makes the Toronto Blue Jays one of my favorite stacks to get to on the entire slate. I don't want to tip my hand too much about overall the stacks. I like, we're not going to have anything to talk about for the last 30 minutes. Uh, but considering how much I like the Blue Jays offense as a stack, that's, gonna, that's just going to have me gravitate more towards Mitch Keller over Christian Javier. It actually has less to do with the pitchers themselves as much as what I like about the offenses and how I'm going to be building my lineups around them. That's fair. I like Toronto's offense more also, but I, I also like Washington's offense here. So it's I would go to Keller before Javier just to answer the question. I don't think it's particularly close either. Um, 
Keller cheaper, less ownership, better top two percentage. Like, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's where I'm going here. I prefer uh, Mitch Keller to Christian Javier. It's also a little bit cheaper, which never hurts, $600 less. He also has an easier matchup. The Nationals are a much worse offense than Toronto Blue Jays, and it's not even close. Not even close when we're talking about it from that perspective. Cheap pitchers. Let's talk about Kyle Harrison just because he is in a price tier of his own, and then we'll talk more about the Fandle pitching specifically after we break some of this stuff down from DraftKings. It's more or less going to be the same, but there are definitely some minor differences between the uh, two sites. So Kyle Harrison is somebody who uh, Am Jamison in chat did bring up a, a pretty good point. Andrew Jemison saying that I uh, feel like people loved Harrison last year. Yeah, he was super chalky when he first got called up. And people hate him this year. And he's talking about him being a good K guy. Yeah, he is a pitching prospect with a lot of strikeout upside. He was also somebody who was very highly touted going into his MLB debut last year. He's cheap, but has a very difficult matchup. Uh, maybe that's underselling it. Say he has a very difficult matchup. He's got like the hardest matchup possible against the Los Angeles Dodgers. If you look at the numbers that we got out of Harrison last year, he did have a strikeout rate in the mid 20% range, 23.8%. The results also were pretty solid. For Kyle Harrison, he had Fangraphs freezing on me again. You try to make a, a big point here. You get all excited about it, and then the data disappears from the screen. Uh, but let me try refreshing this. It froze. Do you have Kyle Harrison's numbers in front of you by chance? Uh, no, but I can get them if yours. All right, go cool. up. Oh, it's it's. Uh, we're back. Fangraphs is back. Here we go. Uh, it was a 4.15 ERA, 4.55 expected ERA. But if you look at the minor league numbers, here's where things get really interesting to me with Kyle Harrison. He had a 35.6% K rate in AAA. So the most likely scenario is the Dodgers are going to smack him around a little bit. But if he's able to weather the storm of the uh, devastation that is the Dodgers offense, he's likely to put up a good amount of strikeouts. So is Kyle Harrison at 15% ownership, somebody that you're willing to be rostering? If I were multi-entering, yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily a hate of Kyle Harrison. It's the fact that he opened up against the Padres and now is facing the Dodgers. Like, as someone who plays minimal lineups, I don't see the reason to get to Harrison here. I would still use him over a bullpen guy to answer the previous question. Like, he does have strikeout upside. He's not crazy on a slate like this because he does have that strikeout upside. He was good in that start against San Diego. I prefer Bassett. Bassett's more expensive. But I think Harrison, for me, is like right on the Mitch Keller level. I like him more than Javier. Um, but that just has a lot to do with how much I like Toronto's offense. So, yeah, I think Harrison is like in consideration. But, again, knowing that there's a ton of risk going up against this lineup. Yeah, Kyle Harrison's uh, probably going to be more of a no-go for me in the lineups that I have built out here. Let's see, where did I end up on Kyle Harrison? Yeah, he's basically not showing up at all. And I know Jordan's got the Sims on the screen there as well, so we could filter by some of that. But I've got Harrison less than 10% of my lineups. If I'm going to go cheap at pitcher, just give me Trevor Williams. I think that that's a way if I'm looking to punt, he, I don't think his expected output is all that much different from Kyle Harrison, at least in terms of our uh, projections here. We've got Kyle Harrison, 17.4% chance to be one of the top two scoring pitchers. We've got Trevor Williams, 16.1%. Trevor Williams is pitching at home against the Pirates. We all know that's a much easier match than being on the road against the Los Angeles Dodgers. And then another thing to consider as well about Trevor Williams, he's $1,900 less expensive than Kyle Harrison. So if I'm looking to make a Dodger stack and I'm trying to maybe save salary a little bit at pitcher, uh, Trevor Williams is the guy that I like to go to for cheap over uh, Harrison there. So Harrison, a no for me. And it's not even like I'm crazy interested in Trevor Williams. It's just he's the cheapest, most viable starting pitcher because I'm not I'm not willing to go to Brown or, or uh, Cal Contrell today. I'm with you. And we got somebody in chat here. Uh, Javier Hernandez says, Brown and Quantrill and spend everything on bats today. I, I would have to build this lineup right now. But if you put Brown and Quantrill at pitcher, are you still leaving money on the table if you spend up for the most expensive bat in every lineup spot? Let's see. Probably not, because third is not expensive and neither is catcher. All right. So Quantrill and Brown, that gives you over $5,000 for remaining salary for every spot. And, oh, yeah, because 
yeah, there's a bunch of really expensive Dodgers. Either way, though, not a not a route that I'm looking to go down at all today. Same. Uh, okay, let's look at the uh, any any interests at. Like, I mean, we just said we don't want to roster the the two cheap pitchers together in the same lineup. Are you considering either of them individually? No, I do think the weather probably boosts them in on one hand because it's really bad conditions and that always is better for pitchers. On the other hand, the game might not play. It probably doesn't play and the pitchers suck. That's where I'm at as well. It is going to be a no for me here. And let's go into Discord and see what people are asking us in here. Uh, first from Woody. Woody wants to know, what are we doing with the uh, Cubbies reliever? Yeah, well, uh, and then he followed up afterwards and said that answer that. Yeah, not playing him today. Cubs reliever, not somebody I'm interested in. And then uh, bees in your ass. Boy, the, the guy before who was upset about the other uh, Discord handle, he's not going to be thrilled with this one either. Bees in your ass wants to know, contrarian in the uh, lineup generator today yeah for like three four mlb slit mlb uh game slates i think it makes a lot of sense to build contrarian lineups in the lineup generator it's still going to give you some popular players but uh less so obviously than if you selected like the contra the um uh, the the chalk setting or the balance setting so i prefer to go contrarian for that on really small slates next question we have here is from uh fantastico and he's saying how do you see getting different than the field to take down a GPP today on DK? Matt, if you had to just give one strategy to most differentiate your lineups for this slate, what would it be to answer the question here? Fantastico. What's a reasonable way to differentiate a lineup today? I'm going to go back to the guy I've written all show in this regard, Chris Bassett. Again, I think he's the second most talented pitcher on the slate projected for the lowest ownership of any pitcher on the slate. Like, easy, easy answer for me. Doesn't mean it's going to work out. Usually I'd say, a, like, a stack in that in that question to answer it, but not tonight. Chris Bassett's going way underrepresented in my mind. He's that guy for me. Yeah, it's going to be, we're going to talk about stacks in a little bit here, but the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, who are what the fourth lowest owned offense on the entire slate. I, I really, really like the Toronto blue Jays offense. So we'll be talking more about them as a stack here uh, shortly. And then let me make sure that there was no other questions that came in here, which uh, no. So let's really quickly talk on the FanDuel pitchers. And for me, when I'm talking about the FanDuel side of things, Matt, it's pretty simple. I don't really see a compelling reason to get away from Tyler Glass now. Just play Tyler Glass now on FanDuel. It's a single pitcher site and just live or die with the results of that. If he happens to have a bad start, like, okay, I could deal with it. But Glass now has got to be the priority for me on FanDuel. And then also you got him as a pretty significant favorite at home against the Giants. He's pretty safe to get the, the win bonus. The quality start bonus also is something that's fairly likely. So uh, I'm going to say Chris Bassett and don't even consider another pitcher. But for yourself on FanDuel, is there something else that you would potentially want to play instead of glass now? No, it's definitely glass now on FanDuel. If you're someone who plays MLB and just like doesn't play the most popular pitcher or stack against that guy, then yeah, maybe you don't want to play glass now, but given the ownership, like I think he's an easy play. Um, I don't like Bassett nearly as much. I think he comes with a lot of leverage still. So if you're using really chalky bats, maybe you'd want to get away from glass now, but that's not how I'd want to play it. I'd play glass now and then try to get different elsewhere with my, with my bats. Yep. That is how I see it as well. Uh, so we'll move on from pitchers here. Anything else you want to talk about? I assume the answer is no, because we've exhausted basically every angle you could take with every pitcher, but I'll make sure just to make sure no stones left unturned. Any, uh, any, uh, I've got a, a message read in the YouTube chat in a second here, but anything else to add about pitchers? Nope. All right. Uh, shout out to a bug boy 4.0 who said that he has his pension on Evan Carter winning the AL rookie of the year this year. You're uh, your guy bug boy. He's back this year to talk about Evan Carter again. Welcome back bug boy. Um, yeah. Evan Carter. I know he was hitting third for the Rangers uh, at least a couple of times this year. He's really, really good. Um, again, it was just that one day. <laughs> so hopefully we can no, reconcile at some point i know hopefully at some point we can move on yeah i don't think bug boy never forget he never will he will he'll hold on to this forever 
If we look at the rookie of the year odds, because I'm kind of curious pulling this up here. Do you know that Evan? He's Carter, probably up there. He is the second best odds to win the American League Rookie of the Year, but also not even the best odds on his own team. Uh, Wyatt Langford from the Texas Rangers have the best overall AL Rookie of the Year odds on the NL side of things. It is uh, Yamamoto who's leading the way, followed by Jackson Chiria, who's off to a good start this year. So let's talk about some of the stacks now, Matt. And on the stack side of things, I'm actually, I'm going to refresh ownership just to make sure I'm looking at the most recent run of everything here. And we'll start by talking about DraftKings here. And we currently have the Pittsburgh Pirates projected for the most ownership by a ton. 24% projected ownership to the Pirates as a team. By the way, another reason that I think that Trevor Williams kind of looks interesting as a contrarian pitching option, because if we're going to have the Pittsburgh Pirates truly coming in here at 24% ownership when there's not another single team 18% or higher, this is the chalk by a mile in the Pittsburgh Pirates. What do you make of all the ownership going to them? I mean, I get it because Tre Trevor Williams is not good and he doesn't miss bats, a lot of them at least. So I get why they're getting love. They're cheap. They've been good this year. Trevor Williams sucks. So I don't think it's like outlandish that they're coming in so popular. They are the highest top stack on the board. They're not the team that I'm going to, that I'm going to play hard. You know, I'm not prioritizing them because it's not like the pirates have a lineup full of guys like the Dodgers does. And they're in like such an unmissable spot. Like it, you know, it has to work out. It's, likely to work out at least 20% of the time they're expected to be the top stack always risky fading an offense against Trevor Williams but I like the Blue Jays more I like the other side of this game more so the Pirates are you know if the ownership were flipped between them and the Nationals I'd like the Pirates a lot but it's an ownership thing for me here I'm not willing to ride the Pirates ownership sounds like you're not either it's so, so high. And let me go and look at what I have as far as stack exposures here. Because, yeah, I mean, I get to Pittsburgh, but in terms of five-man stacks, I've got half of what the field has. So if I was uploading 150 set of lineups right now, I'd be playing 12% five-man pirate stack. So it's not it's not 0% of them. It's hard to outright say, you know, you're feeding a team on a, three, a four, potentially three-game slate but well underweight to the field I come into here on the Pittsburgh Pirates. And uh, another reason why as well, that before when somebody asked uh, our guy, uh, BBC uh, G and Mouth, uh, eight, because the first seven were already taken, asked what the uh, big ball or sorry, the BBC play of the day is. I'm actually leaning more towards Trevor Williams at pitcher now as we're talking more through it, just when you consider the ownership on the Pirates. So if, if you're looking at leverage for this slate, I think the chance of Trevor Williams having a good game relative to his price tag is more realistic than Tyler Glass now getting hit around by the San Francisco Giants. If you're just looking like the extreme leverage spots. I agree. My only counter to that would be like the Pirates can suck and Trevor Williams can just not be great because he doesn't strike out a lot of guys. That's um, true as well. You know, so like I do think that there's like, like if Glass now is awful – the Giants will probably be good. Like happens a couple times a year. No guarantee. Like Glass now could not be great, and the Giants could just suck also. So kind of feel the same about both spots, to be honest. Let's pull up some of uh, Trevor Williams's numbers here, and yeah, I mean he's certainly not uh, not good by any means. And yeah, to your point, there's definitely a scenario here where he goes out, pitches uh, five innings, gives up two runs, has two strikeouts, and finishes with you know nine fantasy points. So it is uh, certainly something that's within the realm of outcomes here. But just based on the ownership of Pittsburgh, it is something that uh, does still have me getting to uh, Trevor Williams. He's he's my current second most rostered pitcher behind Tyler Glass now. Yeah. So I will say, like, to counter my point, the pitching options aren't great today. So, like, more than likely, if Pittsburgh is not good, Williams at least did enough where, like, he's fine at his price tag on the slate without good pitching options. So... On a norm on a main slate, maybe it would just be fading Pittsburgh and not playing any of Williams. But on this slate, I think it does make a lot more sense just thinking about it more. Got a question here from uh, Chacho. Ch so th this might be a, th this might be a non vulgar name, but I don't know. Maybe Chacho means something I don't know about in Spanish. And so maybe uh, once again, 
we've got another name going here. But anyway, Chacho is saying, do we lock Mookie into a single entry lineup every slate until the end of time, Matt? I mean, I couldn't argue with anyone that does. He's the hottest hitter in baseball to start the year for sure. Already five home runs. And it's not like this is a fluke. I mean, you could argue he's the best hitter in baseball. So I don't think that's a crazy strategy. It's not something I'm doing, but he's the best hitter in baseball right now. So I wouldn't fault anyone for just playing him. Uh, Chuck Deuces has let us know that uh, Chucha is a uh, vagina, but that's not what his name is. His name is, is Chacho, which I have looked up over here and it is a uh, Spanish slang for uh, a masculine man. So, all right, that that's, that's, that's fair play, right? That, that's, that's no, uh, no, I'm sure there's going to be another one that's going to pop up that'll uh, get us in discord in a little bit here, but we've got a question here from Sotex. Sotex wants to know for a FanDuel GPP in the utility spot, do we prefer Tucker tonight or Will Smith? Kyle Tucker or Will Smith? Can you pull up the player compare tool, Jordan? Also, uh, Sotex, it's going to also let me know, is there any uh, stacking consideration here, Sotex, for your lineup? Like, do you have more exposure to the Astros or the Dodgers in your lineup at the moment? Because that'll also skew some of my thoughts on this if it's um if it's something where it's like well you've already got three dodgers in your lineup and don't have any players from the astros we do um is it all good all right so if if the options there are going to be Will Smith or Kyle Tucker, let me check to see which player I have more exposure to in my lineups. That is Kyle Tucker for me. So if it's just a 1v1 and there's no stacking considerations, Kyle Tucker, he says he currently has three Dodgers and two Astros. Yeah, so you're going to have a stack either way, 3-3. Three, three. But yeah, I'll go Kyle Tucker there. Matt, do you have a preference between Kyle Tucker and Will Smith? I'm playing Bassett, so like I want to say Will Smith, but I feel like the answer between those two is probably always Tucker. So that's my answer. And as far as uh, Chacho's question about locking Mookie in single entry, no, I don't think you have to lock Mookie into single entry every slate for forever. But he's certainly a good option. But no, you don't. You don't have to lock him. Very rare do you have to lock somebody in baseball. The closest thing to a lock today is Tyler Glass. Now, was that not a rhetorical question? Am I off there? Which uh, which part? The Mookie one. Like, I think it was just like, Mookie's been so good. Um, I thought it was just like, for me, obviously you don't lock any hitter in every slate anytime forever, but he is like probably the best one-off hitter right now. Let me look. What is my... So if I was rostering one hitter as a one-off today... I do have a good amount of Mookie. Let's see. So if we're doing it like price agnostic. I would actually go with Shohei Otani over Mookie for today. Mostly because Otani is half the ownership. That's fair. I mean, I love both of them. Uh, you know, given how they've started the seasons, I wouldn't fault anyone for you know, just playing Mookie, but I'm with you. Like tonight specifically, I also like Otani more. Yeah. So uh, if I was only rostering one hitter and I mean, Mookie's certainly a good one, but sure, Otani for half the ownership, that's something that's uh, certainly going to be appealing to me on this slate. So uh, as far as offenses go, if you were just stacking one offense, Matt, we've talked about all the ownership going to Pittsburgh, so that's not going to be our answer. But if all things being considered, ownership, your expected output, you're picking one offense to play right now. Which direction are you going to? Definitely Toronto. They're my priority here. We talked about it last time Javier was on the slate. He gives up power. Toronto, after facing Blanco, who was just filthy the other night, and then Fran Valdez, who was very good last night, got the win, uh, scoring two runs in the ninth inning. I really like their potential to just blow up here, kind of like Houston did in game one. Toronto is not getting a ton of ownership either. 
they're the least owned of all the sing of all the teams getting single di- or double digit ownership. So I like them a lot here. They're my favorite stack on the board. I also like Washington, but the ownership's there. So my favorite is Toronto. It's Toronto for uh, me. I've been alluding to it throughout the show here. And Christian Javier, I'll pull up his uh, numbers that we were referencing the other day when he made his first start of the season. Javier's not bad. He, he's a he's a very, very solid starting pitcher. Last year was a little bit of a down year for him. But uh, what really interests me about stacking against Christian Javier is just the way that he gives up his runs. He has a ground ball rate that is non-existent. Super, super low, sub 30% ground ball rate. You almost never see high quality starters that have a ground ball rate that is quite this low. Another thing on top of that, that you almost never see, if a pitcher is a very, very high fly ball rate, that typically means they don't surrender very many home runs per fly ball. That is also not the case for Christian Javier. Christian Javier has a 10.9% career home under fly ball rate, so right in line with league average, and his ground ball rate is 26.5% for his career. The highest ground ball rate he has ever had was 29%, and that was in his first season in the big leagues. So if you have a guy who it's three out of every four balls hit against him are being hit in the air, and of those ones, you're getting like 10% of them are turning into home runs, you got a guy who over the course of the season can average giving up like one and a half, two homers per start, and that's something that could be just a boon for stacks for opposing players there. So Toronto Blue Jays, Christian Javier is not the worst pitcher on the slate, but he's the pitcher when he gets blown up, has the most favorable outlook for opposing hitters. So Toronto Blue Jays, that's going to be my favorite stack on the slate. That's also I'm going to be playing in single entry tonight, Matt, the Toronto Blue Jays. Well, good thing I am playing four entry max and not single entry because I'm playing (laughs) them too. And uh, let's see if there was any other questions that uh, came in here. Not for uh, now. I see 50 wanted to know about the Astros. They're getting added to the uh, top batters tool right now. So that should be back in there uh, fairly, fairly soon. And then uh, there was also something in here from big top dog said, Greg, go back to live before lock for NBA. How can you turn your back on the guy? I'm not turning my back on anybody. I'm here every day. I'm doing a gazillion shows, working on other stuff as well. Start a baseball season, trying to make sure that uh, we get everything rolling here. By the way, Reds and Phillies expected to start between uh, 7.30 and 7.45. So for people wondering about that game, that game also looks like it's going to be playing later tonight at the same time as the night slate. We're going to have that game undergoing as well. Uh, So talking about some of the other stacks for the slate, Matt, we went over the Toronto Blue Jays, a team that you and I are both liking quite a bit. We like being underweight to the Pirates because they have aggressively high ownership. Looking at the other teams, though, we've got the Dodgers, 17% owned. The Astros are at 15%. Are there any other offenses that relative to ownership are priorities for you behind the Toronto Blue Jays? I'm going to go with the Nationals. Um, You know, liking Glass now and Bassett and the Jays who are kind of expensive E need some cheap bats. And I like the spot Washington's in against Keller. Like I get Keller being in play because of the other pitching options. Washington's not very good. Keller has looked off all spring training. His velocity's down. It's a good spot for Washington in my mind. So yeah, like the ownership's there, but they're still lower owned than the Dodgers, the Pirates, the Astros, basically right in line with the Blue Jays. So it's Washington for me here. I think they fit in nicely with a lower owned Toronto stack. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to get to Washington just relative to Sue, uh, to some of the other teams on the slate, uh, but the Blue Jays, they're making up a big bulk of uh, my lineups here. It's also going to be hard for me to get away from the Houston Astros. Uh, I do agree with you that Chris Bassett is a pitcher who makes sense for uh, contrarian purposes, but at the same time as well, this is a very, very talented Astros offense, and it is the overall uh, second-best offense on the slate we have behind the Los Angeles Dodgers. The problem I just always have with the Dodgers, they are so expensive making five-man stacks of them. It's like if you're making a five-man stack of the Dodgers today, you you kind of have to play Trevor Williams that lineup, don't you? Yeah. You know, that's – I was going to say, you're playing – you know, you mentioned it, that Trevor Williams is your second highest owned pitcher behind glass now. If that's the case, I would expect you'd be getting to more Dodgers. I mean – 
it's how you get to the Dodgers, which also puts Trevor Williams in play. Um, Dodgers are crazy expensive. And the other problem with them, like I'm always a proponent, and I've talked about this, of getting to like bottom of lineups. And I think that's in play tonight. But they pinch hit a lot with the bottom of their lineup, especially against lefties. And the bottom of their lineup has been atrocious. And it's not like that good on paper. So you're definitely like wanting to get to the big guys when you pay for the Dodgers. And they're all really expensive. So yeah, I think like just talking this slate out with you, I do think that that put William that puts Williams even more in play, just when you consider the context of that. Yeah, let me right here sort by I'm just gonna throw in if we go to like the expected top five, like the top five hitters in the Dodgers lineup. So we'll say Will Smith, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani. Who do you consider their fifth best hitter now? I mean, their fifth best hitter, probably, you mean, they're probably Will Smith. Um, so I'm saying uh, as the top four, Smith, Freeman, Beto, oh, Tani. Who do we have? As I think the it's fifth? very comparable between Teoscar and Muncie. I think it's those two guys, probably Muncie, but I like both of them. Yeah. All right. So I'll put, I'll put Muncie in here just for the sake of this. If you put those five Dodgers into a lineup together, you now only have $4,300 left for two pitcher spots, your shortstop spot, and two outfield spots. <laughs> All right, so let's just see if you put Glass now in this lineup. It doesn't work. You can't play Glass now with the top Dodgers hitters. All right, so let's go Trevor Williams. Just by default, you're going to have to have Trevor Williams in there. If you go Trevor Williams, Mitch Keller, and the top five Dodgers hitters, you have $2,500 left for the shortstop and two outfield spots. It, it, I don't it, even know it, if that's it, doable tonight because of the positions. Like, there aren't really cheap guys everywhere. It's really hard. It's it's really hard to make five-man Dodgers stacks. Yeah, which is going to really lower their ownership. They'll be owned in pieces because they're some of the best bats on the slate. But it's impossible, basically, to five-man stack the Dodgers one through five. Yeah, it is really difficult to do, and that's what's going to prevent me from getting to the Dodgers. That's why I said if I'm paying up for an offense, it's going to be the Houston Astros. Not because I don't like the Dodgers. It's just it's so hard to roster the batters I want to unless I'm just playing the guys at the end of the uh, order there. Uh, by the way, shout out to uh, Kyle Krings in the chat. I asked, uh, Greg, can we start uploading the MLB content to Spotify again? And thanks. We're working on it. There is uh, the podcast uh, platform that we use to upload podcasts. We got locked out of our account somehow, and nobody could get back into it. So we're working on it, but it is a bigger pain in the ass than it should be. So yeah, we haven't been able to upload podcasts for the last. Oh, all right. So Kyle, good news. Jordan says that uh, as of tomorrow, we're all we're going to be all good to go. So everything's going to be able to be up uploaded again. But yeah, this it was an issue. It's, we didn't just decide we weren't going to do it anymore. We try to upload stuff to podcasts. We make podcast revenue. There's no reason we wouldn't do it, but. Yeah, we just got locked out of our account. So it'll be back up soon. Let's see what we have for other questions in Discord because I see a couple of these came through here. First from Einsteinium. So we'll answer these questions, Matt, and then we'll do our uh, dong in the night and get out of here. I got I to gotta get the perfect week going. I, I've got a chance to be hitting on home run picks every day this week. It's a lot of pressure. It's a feat nobody's pulled off before. It would be one of the true feats of uh, Western civilization. Einsteinium is asking us, uh, he said, you know that we said Toronto is uh, my single entry stack. He wants to know, would San Francisco be my second favorite single entry stack? Um, well, here's the good thing about single entry. I only have to pick one team. But if I have to go to a second favorite I, stack. I know it would not be San Francisco for you. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be San Francisco. No, like no way. I think that we both agree that's more of a multi-entry type team. Um, just because of the leverage against you probably, before we do our home run call, you probably want to save that flannel and not wash it because the hall of fame is going to ask for it after you get this home run call pick, right? It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. The next question um, is from master PJ. Master PJ says, what do we do with good hitters on teams facing the chalk pitchers? One offs for leverage or avoid or do nothing. Okay. So he says, what to do with good hitters on teams facing chalk pitchers? 
All right. So it's going to be different on different bases. So like for me today, if I'm playing one lineup, I'm not rostering anybody from the San Francisco Giants. Here's the spot where I want to attack chalk pitchers. I want to attack the chalk pitchers who are not actually good. The guys who just the field is kind of like, ah, you know, it's it's something in hindsight. Like I wish I would have done more with like AJ, AJ Puck on the first day when you and I were on it. These are the pitchers we generally want to be stacking against that are chalk for leverage. It's not your Tyler Glass nows, right? Because bad starts from Tyler Glass now, they're few and far between. But when you get guys that are going to be chalk, and there isn't uh, an apt comparison for tonight's slate because you got over 50% ownership going to Tyler Glass now, then it's pretty spread out past then. Although I guess to some extent, the Blue Jays going up against a uh, above average Christian Javier kind of fits the bill for this. But it's anytime you see these pitchers who are not good or mediocre pitchers that are making their way into lineups just because of matchup or the price point or where the slate breaks out, those are the pitchers I want to be stacking against. Big same. Um, I think there's always merit in MLB, and there's people that play like this that just stack against the chalkiest pitchers. It's not how I play. There's merit in it because of MLB. I do think that I was kind of taking the question in another direction in that like using a hitter or two against one of your pitchers. I don't normally do that, but I don't like have a thing against it. Like tonight, even with like the giants, like let's say you really just wanted to play glass now and the Pittsburgh stack, it's going to be really popular. Mm -hmm. So I think a way to get different is to use a uh, Jorge Soler or whatever. Like we don't think glass now is going to throw a complete game shutout. He's just the best pitcher by far on the slate. We'll probably give up a couple runs. A giant or two will probably be good. I don't want to pick that out, but I think like you can if that's a way you want to get different, I guess is the best way I'll put it. And let's finish with this before we hand it over to the Live Before Lock crew. First off, guys, if you haven't done it, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget, today is the last call for the Dinger promo. If you want to sign up for any package that we have for baseball at Stokast and get 30% off, that deal is going to end today. So your last chance to get 30% off, you can sign up with any of the links below. Sign up for the Sims tool. I use that to build my lineups every day. Matt relies very heavily on the top stacks tool, the top pitchers tool, and our player projections, ownership projections. That's all included in the data package. Or if you want to sign up for the lineup generator package, you can sign up using the link below. It is the most cost-effective package that we have over on the site for lower dollar players, and it also gets you access to the Discord channel. It's going to build lineups for you. But now, dong of the night, Matt. Who are you going with? You know... I'm tired of going with these guys that just can't hit home runs. So tonight I'm changing it up. I'm going with proven home run hitter, monster masher, Lane Thomas. Uh, oh, can't, can't <laughs> fail with Lane Thomas. So uh, for, for myself, for myself, I'm going with Vladdy, Vladdy today. Vladimir Love Guerrero it. Jr. It's, it's the matchup against Christian Javier we talked about before. Pitcher who gives up a lot of hard contact, a lot of fly balls, and then right around a league average home run to fly ball rate. This is a guy who gives up dingers. And that's why Vlad Jr., that's the dong pick of the night for me. So, guys, thank you very much for watching. Right after this, we got NBA Live before lock, and then I'm going to be on playback with Josh right after that, and uh, we'll be looking at some of what happens during the baseball slate. We'll be sweating the basketball games and potentially doing some giveaways, all that kind of fun stuff on playback. So, hope to see you guys there. Good luck tonight, and I'll see you later.